So this, this is a heavy topic. I'll just say that at the outset. It's kind of, as I said to some people, it's kind of the ultimate theological question. The ultimate question is, what is the final end of everything, right? What is heaven, hell? You know, the reason I end up writing a, a book over a thousand pages is because there's a lot of debate historically over these questions. Um, so this is not uh, pepperoni pizza and relay races. So this is a kind of a heavy topic. Um, we're not, today, in the limited time we have, we're not going to be able to sound the depths, so to speak, like drop the, uh, the plumb line and go all, sound all the way to the bottom of the ocean, so to speak. But we'll talk about some of the main uh, topics and issues. I want you to feel frank. Uh, to, to, that you can frankly uh, raise any questions, issues that you have when we have some discussion. Um, we could start with uh, um, a definition. So what, what is universalism? How many of you have actually heard that word in conversation at some point? So can anyone give me just a definition? What is universalism? The belief that everyone goes to heaven. That's essentially, that's essentially it, yes. It actually could be even though the discussion around it is complex and has many different aspects, the basic idea itself is rather straightforward. Everyone is saved. And, and now who's included in the everyone? everyone. You're tempted to say everyone. everyone. But be more specific. What, every, sorry? Any living person, okay, all human beings, right? Could, could you add anything to human beings? Maybe Anything angels? come to mind? No, the universe says all human beings without exception. But anything else? Any other entities in the universe? It may not come to mind right away. Think of the title of my book. Supernatural. Yeah, what about the fallen angels? That actually comes up more often. That's why I titled my book The Devil's Redemption. Is I was, that if, you, if, you're, if your thesis, your driving idea, is that God must save every intelligent creature, by intelligent creature, I mean a creature that has a will that makes decisions, that has moral choices. A stone doesn't have moral choice, a human does. In Christian theology, angels have moral choices as well. So if, if God must save all intelligent creatures, then that would have to include the fallen angels too, right? So we would be speaking of the devil's redemption. So that's kind of where the title uh, came from. So. Um, what I'm going to do is I have a PowerPoint to, to, to walk you through some of the historical discussion. There are a couple of handouts. You should have one that, that says what's wrong with universalism. So we'll come to that a little bit later. Another that just has some quotations. The quotations represent many different points of view. And if we had longer, I would probably send you into small groups and have you read through some of the quotations and put some notations uh, next to that. Like put a, a star if you agree with it. You could put a um, uh, a check if you disagree, and then a question mark if you're not sure. So that would be something for discussion if, if, uh, if, we, if we had time to follow up on that. As I'm doing a, a, an overview and talking about oh, some no. key terms and ideas, I want you to be thinking about three things that we can include in our discussion today. One is the question, why is universalism in our culture today increasing? Why is it increasing? Why are more and more, and I'm thinking of those in Christian, one, uh, one kind of Christian church or another, one denomination or another, uh, why is it increasing? Because it's almost, in the last decade, couple decades, there's been a real significant increase in the number of books promoting the idea that wasn't acceptable to, to up, up to quite recently. Why is it increasing? And then secondly, I want you to be thinking, what would be the, the strong arguments or strongest arguments in favor of universalism? And what would be the strongest arguments against it? Okay, so if you're think, we'll think of those things, then um, that will give us some points of reference to come back to in the discussion. So we start off, I've, if you look on the overhead, I have Jesus and the two thieves. Um, what's the story there with the two thieves? Anyone recall from the Gospel of Luke? Right, there's one, it said that the two, if you read closely in, in, in Luke chapter 23, it says they were cursing him. It says they, so it seems to have been both. But one of the thieves had a change of heart. 
And we don't know what his name was. Traditionally, the name Dismas is given to him. We, that was just a kind of invented name in church history. But he says to Jesus at one point, remember me uh, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly, you will be with me today in paradise. And that's interesting because here are two that are both guilty, both sinners, both receiving what, what is the penalty due to their, their crimes. And yet there are two different responses. And that's sort of symbolic of the world that we live in. The cross of Christ is, is placed down in the midst of the world, and yet there are not, there's not one response, there's more than one response to, to Jesus. A little bit about myself here. This is a little bit of an out-of-date picture. That, this is when my daughter still liked me, you know, <laughs> or pretended to like me. No, no, she went through that phase, and then she, she kind of likes me again, so I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to say but so I was born in Washington, D.C. I call myself a Midwestern Californian because I lived about 10 or so years in California, Chicago, um, Santa Barbara and San Diego, two beautiful towns. Too much sunlight, though. You know, I had to get away from that, come to St. Louis here. Um, so I lived in Connecticut, St. Louis, England, Delaware, Georgia. So I've been around, been at a number of different universities. I studied a number of schools, Northwestern University in England, Sussex, Trinity Divinity School, Yale, and the University of Chicago. And then there are a number of schools that I've taught. Some of you may have heard of uh, Wheaton College. That was a, for my first teaching job. I taught in Southern California at Westmont College, which is a Christian school like Wheaton, and then University of California, San Diego. Emory University in Atlanta, St. Louis University currently I also taught in England. Here are some books, these are covers of some of the books I've written or edited. Uh, they deal with topics like the history of revivals, um, the life of Jesus, a little book in the left, bottom left corner, Familiar Stranger, that's uh, an introduction to Jesus of Nazareth. I've written on Jonathan Edwards and the one on the, the, the bottom right is The Devil's Redemption, that's the big the big behemoth, because it is such a, a large, why, did it, why was it so long? Because the issue of universalism was debated on and off for 1,800 years. So that's about 100 pages, 70 to 80 pages, I guess, per century in the book. So, so and I looked at all the different arguments that were laid out by people writing in different languages as well. So, okay, so let's jump into it. A controversy in 2011. How many of you have heard of the book, Love Wins? Anybody? Okay, so that would have been, you would have been <coughs> seven years younger. So this made the, the news in a significant way in the Christian community, and it even spilled over into secular media in 2011. Rob Bell, who was a graduate of Wheaton College, the college I mentioned, where, of course, where Billy Graham, most famous uh, alumnus, had attended himself. But he did this book called Love Wins, and the thesis of this book was he said at the heart of this perspective, his perspective, he said, is the belief that given enough time, everybody will turn to God and find themselves in the joy and peace of God's presence. And then he continues, he says, the love of God will melt every hard heart and even the most depraved sinners will eventually give up their resistance and turn to God. So that's the a, that's a general thesis of Love Wins. Now, he didn't like the word universalist. He says, oh, but I'm not a universalist. Well, sure sounds like it, right? Sure seems that way. The overall direction of the, the he, he raised, someone said in the, in the first five or six pages, he had like 42 questions. He said, you know, there's a lot of questions here. So he did a lot to raise questions, yeah. Speaking of questions, I don't mean to interrupt, but Mike, do you think it's important to mention that Rob Bell at the time uh, I mean, he was really kind of this evangelical golden boy. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he was releasing these videos called the NUMA videos mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that many uh, young people mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. were maybe not feeling mom and dad's church, mm -hmm. well, they were really feeling Rob Bell's way of talking about Christianity. Mm -hmm. And he seemed theologically conservative in the early Good years. Point. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. I think it's fair to say in 2008, 2009, if... Uh, um, Faith Ascent were up and going at that point. Rob Bell might have been well on the list of speakers to invite. Yeah, yeah. And this is what really surprised people. This is a guy who's, who planted a new church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is known for being a pretty conservative town, with a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Leviticus. 
Now, it doesn't get much hardcore than that, like an exegetical preacher used from the Old Testament. And, so, and he had a church of several thousand members. And so when he changed his view, of course, that led to turmoil within the church at that point. But it, it shocked the evangelical world because he was saying, you know, just as you can have different views of the rapture or different views of, you know, the end time, so you can be an evangelical universalist or you can be a particularist universalist, a universalist who believes that some but not all are saved. So he put this, he, he launched this, put this on the map, and this is really how I became involved in this issue. I, um, I was walking by the newsstand and there was a cover of Time Magazine in 2011 that says, what if there is no hell? That's what they put on their, their cover on Easter week, 2011. You can go back and check that out. It used to be they used to celebrate Christianity in the, in the mainstream media. Now they raise questions, Easter time, Christmas time. It's a little bit different different media environment today. But I, I, I sense the Holy Spirit sort of stirring in me, and then after that, I went into Breadco, St. Louis Breadco, and it was a circle of women. They all had their copy of Rob Bell. They were reading together, and I thought, wow, this is, and the Holy Spirit saying, like, you need to, you need to write on this, so. And then I, I actually had a dream. I had a dream that was very sobering to me. And I mentioned this in a Christianity Today uh, interview that's online. If you're, uh, if you're interested, look under my name, it will pop up. But in the dream, there was a, a, this incredible storm, this tornado, I mean a massive tornado, the kind of tornado that would sweep in and take the Empire State Building and toss it from New York over into New Jersey. I mean this massive storm, like a mile or more across, and everyone was just um, sipping their drinks and I was trying to get people into a shelter in a place of protection and, and at the very end like we went into the shelter and the door closed and the storm swept over us and it's a little personal to talk about this but in, in the dream I heard the voice of God and he said this is my judgment and my people are not ready tell them tell them so it was very sobering but I and the book in some ways is my attempt to respond to that to say there is a reality of judgment. It says in scripture, in Romans 14, it says each of us will give account of ourselves before God. In fact, it even says in, in Matthew, it says we will give account for every, every word that we utter. I mean, there's a lot in scripture about God's, uh, God's judgment. So universalism, the view that everyone is saved. Um, what's this overall situation in the world today? Well, by the, the early 21st century, our day, the trend toward universalism is evident in every part of the Christian world. This is something to really to, to wrestle with. Uh, we mentioned Rob Bell having an impact in the evangelical world, but earlier in the 20th century, the trend really started, for the most part, with, with uh, more of the mainline Protestant churches, somewhat more liberal uh, uh, churches, uh, mainline Protestant sort of led the way, but Roman Catholicism since about the 1980s has had a growing contingent of people who have, some, some call themselves hopeful universalists because Catholic teaching seems to be through the centuries that there are some who are finally lost, not everyone is saved, but a hopeful universalist, this, German, this Swiss theologian named Hans Urs von Balthasar said that it is our duty to hope for the salvation of all. And rather remarkably, and this is the only time in the last 2,000 years this could be said, the Pope himself, Pope Francis, made a number of statements that were really shocking to the whole Catholic world as well as others that care what the Pope might say on a theological topic. In fact, he was quoted by an Italian uh, atheist journalist as saying that there is no hell. There is no hell. That was a direct quote. This is about a year ago, so it seems that my book came out at the right time. Um, so this is Pope Francis saying, and he, he, says, he said right after that, there is no hell, there is the disappearance of souls. Now, if you look at a number of other quotations, the current pope has seemed to embrace a view that was regarded by Catholics in the past as a her heresy, which is called annihilationism or conditionalism. That's the idea. It's not quite universalism, but it's closely related that at the end of, of time, God will separate the sheep from the goats, two different groups, and then almost like instantaneously, the goats will simply cease to exist. So God will cause them to cease to exist. So in the end, 
there are only people in heaven, but that's because of the disappearance of the other group. So that's called annihilationism or conditionalism. So that's another related view. And it seems that our current pope, and this is why this is so surprising, it's like never before in, in the history of the church have these views been entertained, particularly by not someone in such a prominent position. So Eastern Orthodoxy, that would include the Russian and Greek churches, they've historically tolerated this. It was never public teaching in the Orthodox churches, but it was a tolerated view. A certain minority of theologians held that view. And then um, I mentioned the mainline Protestants were kind of in the lead, but really quite recently, evangelical and Pentecostals have begun to say, well, maybe this is a view that we should, uh, we should accept um, as well. To define some of the terms, you already talked about the term universalism, but I want to distinguish that from some other words here that we should keep uh, distinct from one another. Inclusivism is a view that some people may be saved by Jesus Christ apart from consciously hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and responding to it in faith. Now notice if you're an inclusivist, you kind of expect that there will be some surprises at the end, that some people have actually responded to God even though they didn't hear about Jesus. And in, in my view, in the book that I wrote, The Devil's Redemption, I'm not really arguing against inclusivism. I think there's a significant place for different opinions among Christians on that. You can be an inclusivist without being a universalist. You can think that some of those who haven't heard of, about Christ um, are finally included in salvation. Does that make sense to you all? Okay, the universalist makes a strict claim that everyone without exception will definitely be saved in the end. The inclusivist will leave that as kind of an open question as far as how far, how, how large is the scope. There are very difficult questions that we could ask. For instance, what about the mentally disabled? What about someone who is disabled to the point they can't really intellectually understand the offer of the gospel? And, and someone could say, well, wouldn't God's mercy be upon that person because they were disabled, they were not able to respond? Wouldn't, God certainly wouldn't condemn them for not responding to a message that they couldn't even understand. Well, those, that seems to me like, well, that's, that's a, a, a consideration you know, worth bearing in mind. We might not be able to answer all of the questions that we could pose like that. But so the inclusivist is interested in those kinds of questions. And what happened historically is that in the 1970s, both Catholics and evangelical Christians started to move to, um, to embrace a more inclusivist view rather than an <coughs> exclusivist view. The exclusivist would, exclusivist would say, unless you specifically respond to Christ, you must hear about him and respond, you cannot be saved. Inclusivists say, well, we're not quite so sure on that. We think it may be possible to respond. And, but what's happened in the last 15 to 20 years is the inclusivism has shifted into universalism, which is much more problematic, I think, because it, it does undercut the idea of individual decision and faith and repentance. Uh, some other related ideas, purgatory. Purgatory is a Catholic notion, specifically a Roman Catholic, that some uh, at the time of their death are not prepared to be with God in heaven, but go through a painful process of purging. That's where the name purgatory comes in. Purging through, through fire. And so it's not hell because it's, it's not eternal in Catholic teaching, but it lasts only a temporary period of time. And everyone in purgatory ultimately leaves purgatory and goes to be with God in heaven. Now, and I have another term, purgationism, to refer to those that have purgatory-like views that aren't Roman Catholics. So this has become a common view among universalists that, that if you, you're not yet ready for heaven, you may go to a kind of pur purgatory-like state, and then after that, be ready to go to heaven. There's also doctrine of the, the doctrine of the second chance. And this is just any view that says that people can repent after death. Death is not final. People can have a further opportunity. There even, I discovered in my research, some theologians that have this idea. Now, I don't see any scripture to support this notion, but that at the moment of death, everyone has a like, kind of like a total life vision, like their whole life flashes before them, and they see everything, and they see God standing on one side, they see their whole life, and that's, they call this the theology of the final decision. 
that you make your decision um, at that moment when you're dying. In the moment of death, then you, you either give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to God. So everyone gets their chance then. Well, you think about that. Think of the implications. If that were true, we wouldn't really need to do evangelism, would we? Like, well, why did Peter and Paul go out and preaching the gospel, the apostles in the first century? You're like, well, just wait till everyone dies. That's when the, that's their opportunity. So this is this is one of the areas where we find in universalism often speculation. A speculation refers to an idea that someone holds that isn't directly supported in scripture, but it's a kind of a maybe. And then some speculation I think is okay. In, in theology, we could talk about, well, what if there was extraterrestrial life? Do you ever think about that? And would salvation apply to extraterrestrial beings? Would they be moral beings who could do good or evil? You know, C.S. Lewis wrote his science fiction series, Paralandra. Anyone read that? Ah, yeah. Okay, so C.S. Lewis was, he was engaged in his, using his imagination, using speculation. And that's the sort of, we may not be able to answer those questions, but they don't undercut the call to preach the gospel. Whereas some of the universal speculations, on my view, are problematic for just that reason. They directly attack the imperative of preaching. Jesus said, go and preach the gospel to all nations, right? And on, on the very first Christian sermon, Acts 2, it says, repent and believe the gospel. And so if you have a theological view, a speculation, that says that's not really necessary, everyone's okay as they are, then that, you see, there's a direct competition between what, we, what the scripture commands us to do and what universalism might suggest that we do. So the second chance idea, annihilationism, I touched on that. Nirvana, what is nirvana? A band in the 1980s, right? Yeah, pretty awesome. Um, um, so, but, uh, but actually, nirvana is a, is a, is a a different view of the of the final state. Anyone know like what is the difference between a Christian view of heaven and a <coughs> and a Nirvana perspective? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the drop falling into the ocean is a common Nirvana literally means extinction. And there's more than one interpretation of that. Some think it's the extinction of desire. The Buddhists believe, for instance, that as long as you're grasp they call it tanha grasping. You live your whole life grasping for one. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. The Buddhists say if you die at that state, guess what? You then come into a new life grasping, grasping, grasping. So they think you have to stop grasping. You stop desiring, then you will die and you will be a candidate for nirvana. And, but nirvana could also mean that the individual self doesn't exist anymore. This is not what scripture teaches, because if you read the account of heaven, the end of the book of Revelation, it's clear individual human beings continue to exist in a resurrected state as individuals, right? Remember the saints from every tongue and tribe and people and nation, John the revelator the, is seeing the vision of them and they're worshiping God, and so they all have their individual identity. The nirvana idea of like merging into the ocean, the drop falling in the ocean, would deny that sense of personal um, identity. So, any questions about these, the definitions here? That's a, that, is a good, that is a good question. Where do the concepts of purgatory come from? It actually first appears in classical literature. Classical literature. You have, you read like Virgil's, the Aeneid. This is, this is published, uh, uh, this is part of the Greco-Roman paganism, non-Christian religion, the idea that fire would purify the individual and through fire they would be purified and prepared to live among the gods. And so it's, it's more of a, of, a, of, a, of a pagan notion, actually. Some look at the, in, first, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and there is a judgment by fire, but if you look at that passage closely, the fire is not touching anyone's flesh, it's not touching their body. What does a fire touch and affect? Anybody know? In 1 Corinthians 3, do you know the passage? Their works. Their works, yeah. And it says you either build with, with gold and silver, you know, things that last, or it says if your works are made of wood, wood hay, and stubble, they will be burned up. So this is really a judgment. It's, and it's, so you could have two believers, one of whom has really lived for the Lord, and his or her works endure the test of fire, and the other 
their works are burned up. That doesn't mean that, he, in fact, Paul says, he says, that person shall be saved yet so as through fire. So the fire will test, he said, the quality of each one's work. So, and actually the contemporary Catholic Church, the biblical, Catholic biblical scholars today, they admit that 1 Corinthians 3 is not really talking about purgatory. There really isn't a passage in scripture that says that human beings after they die go into fire and they're purified. And think of that, if that were true, if I had to, had to be purified through fire, that competes with another very important doctrine. How do we get cleaned up from sin, purified? How are our sins taken care of? Jesus. The cross. Yeah, so this, this was the argument of the Protestants. On this point, I think there's a lot to learn from the Catholic tradition. I teach in a Catholic department. On this point, I'm more with the Protestant reformers, that if Christ made the full payment for me on the cross, then it really doesn't seem to make much sense that I would have to suffer in order to somehow make payment for my own sins. Does that make sense to everyone? I hope I'm not, I may be stepping on some toes here for Catholics who are here, but this is one area where I do think it's very hard to see how these two things can, could go together. Yes. There's some reference, yes, there's some references in purgatory uh, to purgatory, and I think in the book of Maccabees there are references to prayer for the dead. Actually, in my opinion, even in Maccabees it's not particularly clear. The first people in Christian history clearly to teach it were Clement of Alexandria and Origen of Alexandria. Origen made this a major point, and he was living in the third century. So we're talking about, you know, almost 300 years, at, well, more than 200 years after the life of Jesus that this idea emerges. And then it becomes a key idea. Um, and, but even in Catholic theology, it's not till the high Middle Ages that purgatory becomes really a formal teaching. The Eastern Christians, it, the Greeks and the Russians did not actually go along with the purgatory ideas that developed in the West. So it's been a dispute. And then the Protestant reformers I mentioned were strong critics. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's one particular passage um, in, uh, I'll give you the, the verse number here. In Hebrews, it says, um, Hebrews 9, 27 says, just as, as, it is, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Um, the idea that first death, and then also the dying once, that seems to rule out the idea of reincarnation as well. Um, as you read, if you read with an open mind through the Gospels, and before I did this project on universalism, I did a careful verse-by-verse -verse study of the Gospel of Luke, is the one that I picked, but I was struck at how much urgency there is in Jesus' teaching. There's an urgency, like that, that don't put off, you know, decide now to, to follow, uh, to fo you know, to, to repent, to believe in the message of salvation, to receive the gospel. Um, there's the images of the door of the feast that is open for a time and then the door shuts, right? And people are knocking to try to get in, but it's too late. There are, there's the image of the wise and the foolish virgins. Remember, the, the foolish virgins don't have any oil and so they, they don't have oils in their lamp, they have to run off to the oil cellar, and by the time they buy the oil and come back, the door is shut. Now, if you're a universalist, you have to do some exegetical somersaults to try to make sense of these passages, because like, well, the door being shut, in fact, in Luke 13, it says, many will try to enter and will not be able. That's a really clear statement. What the universalist would say is something like, no, 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 that's just a temporary shutting of the door. There's going to be another opportunity. And this is where speculation comes in. That's a dangerous idea to give someone hope for an opportunity that will never come along. Because right? you're encouraging them to continue on their path. And, and human nature is like, you know what? As human beings, we like to sin. We like to do wrong things, right? It says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all else. So we like to sin. And if you say, oh, you can go on sinning a little bit longer, wait later, decide later, maybe even after you die, that is uh, actually an encouragement to continue on the wrong path. In the, in the handout, I use the analogy of someone who's an opiate addict, right? And you say, you know, they're working on this pill, and you only have to take the pill once, and your opiate addiction will go away. So just go on being an addict. It's okay. Well, that's kind of the same thing here, right? The idea, you just keep on sinning. No, sin is very serious. Sin has terrible consequences. And we need, if someone is an opiate addict, I spend my Thursday mornings counseling men who are crack and opiate addicted, I think, 
Um, the last thing I'm going to tell them is like, well, go ahead, keep doing what you're doing. You know, maybe something will happen. No, this is why there's the urgency and the message of repentance is a message like right now. This is the time. Because the mind of the addict is, I can go on a little bit longer. Just one more time. We had a guy that we counseled and he was dead after he left the center. He wanted just one more, he wanted to do it one more time. He got that heroin laced with fentanyl. Some of you may know that fentanyl is like a, a hundred times stronger than heroin and he's not with us any longer. So I use that as an analogy because scripture takes the, 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 the issue of sin so seriously. The, the good news to go with that bad news though is that God has made full provision for our sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. Well, that's, um, yeah, I can address that. I mean, that, would, that might take us a little further afield. The idea of being raptus means simply, in, in from the Latin, means being caught up. So to be caught up with the Lord, there is direct scripture that speaks of that in 1 Thessalonians. It says, um, uh, let's see. In, in chapter 4, we who are alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord will descend from heaven. And um, it says, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, so that's the, that's the direct verse. Now, what is not said there is the timing of this where it fits into a larger pattern. It's possible that as the Lord descends, you know, swing low, sweet cherry, you know that old hymn, you know, send forth your angels, um, that believers will simply be caught up at that moment. There is a view known as the pre-tribulational rapture, that there is a seven year period. The ra you've heard this, right? The rapture at the beginning of the seven years, and then Jesus comes, but Jesus isn't visibly present. He's visibly present in glory at the end of the seven years. On my view, that those are, it's, this is not certain in Scripture. This is not certain. I think it is clear, as Scripture says, believers will be caught up with the Lord. As to when that happens, there's a lot of debate. Well, again, this is a little bit of a tangent, but we who are alive or left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Precede what? Precede into the presence of the Lord. Next verse, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry, voice of an archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Is that what your point? Okay. So there is a resurrection of those who've died. Then, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That's the bottom line, that we're with the Lord. Let's, let's uh, take us a little further. Okay, does, does universalism matter? Does it matter? Why did I devote years of my life to this topic and looking at all the arguments both ways? In fact, the deeper you get into it, you, the more you find that every single area of Christian teaching is directly affected by whether or not you believe that salvation includes everyone without exception or whether it, it, it does not. The nature of God, how do we understand the mercy and the justice of God? Does God punish sin? Does God exercise judgment? If so, how, when, and where? Uh, the freedom of the creature. This is a clear, clear, clearly a question that comes into play at this point. Is it possible that everyone says yes to God in the end? What about hardness of heart? Or is it possible that some harden their heart against God? You know, we could go back to the, the demons in this case. If we believe that demons are actual entities, that this isn't mythic. I think in scripture commits us to, to believing there are such spiritual entities. Where in scripture do we ever have a demon that repents? Think about that. Never, right? We have people that repent and turn from sin and believe. But in the, the first image of the devil, he is, he is tempting Eve in the book of Genesis. The last image, he's thrown into the lake of fire. I'm tempted to say kicking and screaming. There's no, there's no deviation at all on the part of the demons. So, and when Jesus speaks those really, those, those terrifying words at the end of Matthew 25, he says, depart cursed ones, this is to the goats, into the fire prepared for who? 
prepared, he says, for the devil and his angels. He says to the sheep, enter, you can read at the end of Matthew 12, enter into the kingdom forever, but enter, go into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He's saying the fire wasn't even prepared for human beings. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. The devils who, for whatever reason, theologians debate why, but it's clear they never repent, they never turn back. And he's suggesting that some human beings become so hardened in their heart that they don't turn back either. They align themselves with, with Satan himself. In scripture, if you want a picture of that, you might think of the case of the Pharaoh, of the Exodus. Again and again, Moses calls down the plagues, the judgments of God, and what do we read about Pharaoh? How does he respond? Does he say, I'm sorry, Moses, I really made a big mistake? He does soften a couple points, but then it says he hardened his heart, he hardened his heart, he hardened his heart. And the universalists really struggle with Pharaoh because Pharaoh seems to be going the wrong direction. If you're going the wrong direction, how you end up the right way? It'd be like saying, I'm gonna to drive to LA and then you head out east into Illinois. Say, but you say, well, you're, going, you're not going toward California, but I really believe I'm going to California. I'm driving east, I'm gonna to get to California. I don't think that's gonna work. Your car is not water equipped to go all around the world on the surface. It can't hydroplane you know, all the way around to California. So similarly, if the, hardened, the person with the hardened heart is going the wrong direction, and if it's really possible for there to be hardness of heart, then that suggests that there can be, there can be separation in the end, where God in effect says, well, the quote from C.S. Lewis, he said there are only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, your will be done. And then the second kind is those to whom God says, your will be done. And C.S. Lewis famously said that the doors to hell are locked on the inside. So what C.S. Lewis was affirming there was something I think is in scripture, which is that there is a genuine freedom of the creature. Think of it this way. God amazingly made a world in which his creatures actually had the power to say no to himself. And so that's, that's, uh, that's something to, to, to grapple with. Yeah. It says both. It says a couple of times it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Other times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Is that kind of against Pharaoh if God is controlling him, making him destined until his death? That's a big, that's a big question. Um, um, we ultimately, I mean, ultimately I read scripture believing that the human will and the divine will in what we call predestination or coordination, that they ultimately coincide with one another. It is something of a paradox. It's like to say, some are predestined from all eternity for salvation and some are not. You say, and then I say in the second breath, but everyone is called to make a decision in terms of how to respond to God and God that? follows that decision. What would you say that? Was Pharaoh, did Pharaoh have free will or didn't he? He did, yeah. He, he's held responsible, yeah. Otherwise he wouldn't be, if he didn't, have, if he didn't make choices, he couldn't be held responsible. Yeah, but, the choice that, but the choice that he makes is in accord with God's eternal foreknowledge. And I would say foreordination. What um, is he, he, It is a responsible choice because it is a voluntary choice on his part. There was no external compulsion. For instance, if, you, if I were to put a gun in someone's hand and I pull the trigger on them, you say, well, they didn't make that choice. But if someone chooses himself to pick up a gun or to pick up a glass of poison drink, whatever they might do, they are, they are held responsible because it is their free choice. Again, this is, it seems kind of a paradox. One person visualizes it this way. Imagine someone walking toward a door, and the door represents an entry into, the, like, into heaven, and it says, there's an invitation over the door that says, come all you who are weary and heavy laden. You know, enter in. Come all who are weary and heavy laden. You walk through that door with the invitation, and you look back, and what's written over the door? It says, chosen from before the foundation of the earth. You see, that's really hard to, hard to wrestle with. This is one of the most challenging theological questions. And there are differences between Calvinist and Arminian points of view in terms of is the predestination conditional or unconditional. Same debate went on in the Catholic context between the Dominicans and the Jesuits. The Jesuits were more like the Wesleyans than Arminians. Had some, in fact, Wesley may have read some, been influenced by the Jesuit view as it as so happens. But yeah, yeah, I think, yes, and, and election, who is first chosen? Where does this start in scripture? Who's said to be chosen first? Abraham. And the, and the descendants of Abraham. 
So election is an Old Testament teaching. And you say, well, wait a second, how is that fair? What about the Babylonians? Why didn't God choose a Babylonian rather than, than Abraham? Or what about the Egyptians? Or what about in, in ancient America, the Mayan Indians? You say, weren't they chosen? God declares at the beginning that Abraham is chosen, but God's plan was never a narrow plan. It always had a, had a breadth and an expansive character to it. God particularizes in order to universalize. Because what does he promise Abraham? He chooses Abraham, but he said, but in your seed, your descendant, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This was the temptation for Israel to think, we're, you know, we're chosen by God, we're special, we're set apart. And, and honestly, that's still the temptation for the church today. You know, we're set apart, we're the ones. But actually, God intends for the church to be a blessing to the rest of the, the non-church. Just as he, Israel was to be blessed, read Psalm 67. God blesses us, it says, that all the ends of the earth must fear him. So God's purpose was always to spread that blessing around and not to confine it in, in one place. Well, I'm just going to walk briefly through um, some of the history of universalism. This led me into a view known as Gnosticism. And I'll read a quotation. This is going to sound rather strange, perhaps, but this is the notion of the Gnostic God who is evolving a God who must be redeemed himself. There are some, some of the Gnostic type of universalists believe that human beings redeem God. So not that he saves us, but that we save God, because God is incomplete apart from us. So this is uh, from a philosopher named Leitak Kalakowski, Polish philosopher. He said, the evolving God, he said, God, the, God brought the universe into being, he's describing this Gnostic view, so that he might grow in its body. He needs his alienated creatures to complete his own perfection. The growth of the universe involves God himself in the historical process. Consequently, God himself becomes historical. At the culmination of cosmic evolution, he is not what he was in the beginning. He creates the world and in reabsorbing it, enriches himself. Silence prevails in the room. I, I see you're all kind of processing that. You think, well, this is a really odd view of looking at God. Believe it or not, this idea that existed in ancient times as a Gnostic heresy is, has come back in recent years. There is a, a charismatic teacher named John Crowder. He didn't like my book very much when it, it, um, it came out and he told his 15,000 Facebook followers the, the same. So we got into a little back and forth on Facebook. But, um, of course, he gave him a screenshot of just about three sentences rather than the whole argument. So, but Crowder says in his book, Cosmos Reborn, that God is now reabsorbing the universe back into himself. That's like a direct quote from the back cover, reabsorbing the universe. So what does that imply about you and me? That we are like parts of God, right? We're like the sparks that flew out from God and the sparks have to be gathered together. And that's actually what I found in my research. That's kind of the core theology of Gnosticism. Sorry, this image didn't come out too well, but basically the biblical account of salvation is creation, fall, redemption, if you wanted to put it into three stages. For the Gnostic view, it's unity, diversity, unity. In the beginning, in the beginning was God and all of the souls, like the little, the little godlets, so to speak, floating around. And then, according to the Gnostics, these souls fell, and they fell and they got trapped in physical bodies. And then, um, at the end of time, all of the souls that were separated must come back again. Because, because if we are parts of God, God cannot be unreconciled to himself. And so even Lucifer on this view is like, he's like the rebellious brother of Christ. And Christ is, he's like the prodigal son, and Christ is going to welcome him back into the house of the Father. Everything has come out from God, and everything will come back from God. Yeah, what do you, what do you think about that? Well, I, on this, this particular view of God, it's, I mean, it's just the whole idea of the evolving God. God is incomplete. Scripture is very clear that God is complete in himself. Uh, he didn't spill out his own guts to create the world. That's the sort of emanation idea that God spilled out. In general, look at creation. Actually, creation becomes quite important as a doctrine. And I think, you know, you may not 
persuade the person holding this view, but you could go back to Scripture and let Scripture itself speak. That's probably the best one can do. When God creates the world, does, does, is God like a glass of milk that's spilled out on the, uh, across the kitchen floor? No, God creates the world by his word, by his command. He said, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so the existence, so the world is something distinct from God. It's not part of God. It exists by the will of God, and it exists only because God wills for it to exist. So just like this Bible, okay, I, it, it, it sits in the air because I exert force to lift it up. If I take my hand off, it, would, it will fall immediately. And so it, God, the world only exists because God in the beginning brought it into existence. God continues to sustain it. So someone put it in terms of a math formula that the world minus God equals zero. If God disappeared, the world would disappear, right? But then you could turn around the other way and say God minus the world equals God. If the whole world ceased to exist, God would not cease to exist. Now, the people who hold this Gnostic view, they see God and the world as like Siamese twins almost, that like the world is almost as important as big as God is. So that's just a very problematic view. But this is a view that, that is, that's becoming more popular within the culture, because why? It sort of flatters us, right? If we're all parts of God, if God needs us to get his business done, that kind of lifts us up and puts us into an important place. And if you look at some parts of the popular culture, you go to Barnes & Noble reading the book, or turn on Oprah Winfrey. If Oprah Winfrey has a quote-unquote spiritual person on her talk show, or one of any other you know, aspects of popular media, more, more often than not, they're presenting this sort of view of, a, of an evolving God, not a God who is already complete and sufficient. So we have... Uh, Gnosticism, which involves a blending of good and evil, light and darkness. And um, I'm just going to go quickly through some origin was the early church writer who defended universal salvation, really the first to do that. Brilliant man. There's no question about his brilliance. They said that when he, he, he was only like 18 or 19 years old, and he became the head of the catechetical school in Alexandria. And people, he was teaching people that were like, 30 or 40 years older than he was. So imagine that, at your age, imagine that you have students, because you're so brilliant, people come from all around the world who are 50 and 60 years old to sit at your feet. You'd have to be pretty brilliant. And so when he would write, they said he would write, he would decide to dictate, you know, he had scribes to write, and he would have as many as four or five scribes in front of him, and he would dictate the first sentence in the first work, the first sentence in the second work, the next sentence in the third, the fourth, the fifth, and then he would come in on the second sentence of the first work. He would have, he would be, it's like almost a Mozartian type of ability. Imagine that, he had these five different compositions going on in his mind at the same time. So incredibly brilliant, but very much a speculator because he held that the souls that are in the physical bodies now once existed in this abstract realm with God. They existed uh, without bodies, and those souls fell away from God, and then they got, came down into the body. Not the book of Genesis, right? It's not there in Genesis. This is a view that also is still with us. Um, it is actually official Mormon teaching. Mormon teaching is that there are spirit babies that existed with God eternally, and actually they took a vote on who would be the savior. This is official Mormon teaching. I documented in my book. There was a vote taken, and the vote, oh, and Lucifer said, I will be the savior of the world, and Christ said, no, I will be, and everyone voted for Jesus, but guess what? Lucifer didn't like that very well, and so then there was a war in heaven. That's Mormon teaching. So it starts with the preexistent souls. They come into the body. If that were true, if your soul had already existed in another realm, and then when it sinned, it came down into the body, how would that affect the way you look at your life right now? Back, yeah. Before, before the material world, yeah. So if Mormonism is correct, that means we all voted on Jesus? Yeah. Do you don't remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's coming back to me. It's it's back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to punt it a little bit. Um, and Plato had an idea of preexistent souls, too, and he said that, that they choose what life they'll go into. The smart ones, the ones that are greedy want to be born as kings or queens, not realizing that gives you more temptation. And he said the ones who are wiser, they come to a more lowly state. But then he says they drink the waters of Lethe. That's, myth, that's, the, 
the mythical river of forgetfulness. So you forget the life you had before when you come down into the body. There, this whole thing of like past life recall, I'm not recommending you, you Google that, but anyway, there's a whole literature on that, and um, the people that are involved in the near-death experiences too, a lot of them are universalists. They believe everyone's going to a good place, and they had people who report they saw visions of light after their, you know, their vital signs ceased and came back again. But pre-existence, some of this sounds a little bit like Hinduism too, because there's definitely a parallel. Hindus believe in multiple lives, and the devout Hindu man I met many years ago said, you know, I'm not ready for, I'm not ready for uh, final salvation. He says, oh, I have many, many more lives to live before I could ever attain that. He was being humble about his, his Hindu practice, so. Uh, yeah. Th those are the implications. Or Thomas Aquinas, probably the most famous Catholic teacher, one that many Protestants read and learn from. Thomas Aquinas said that to make the body the punishment for sinning in the soul state is to, is to derogate, to diminish from God's goodness as creator. What does it say in Genesis 1? He made something, it was good. It was good, it was good. And then Genesis 1, 31, God sees everything that he has made, and what does he say? It is very good. So the idea of the body as a punishment, um, I, for some reason I always think of the Matrix movies too. Did you see those? Yeah, because they, they kind of have a Gnostic flavor to them because it's like we're trapped in this world of illusion, you know? Red pill, blue pill, right? Uh, do you want to be, be illuminated or to see the truth or do you want to live in the realm of illusion? So that Gnostic motif is sort of reappearing within popular culture. I see several hands up, yeah. Well, that's, that is a possible implication. There actually were people in recent times who took that, that route. When I was teaching at University of California, San Diego, now this would be, this is before your time, you, maybe about the time you were all born. Did you ever hear about a group called Heaven's Gate? They were, actually the church I was attending in San Diego was about half a mile away. This was a, a religious group that was convinced that there was a spaceship hiding behind the Hale-Bopp comet that was visible in the sky at that time. And that when they all drank poison and graduated, I think it was one of the terms they used, graduated to the higher spiritual level, that they would be taken onto the spaceship. And so they committed mass suicide at this beautiful house in the wealthiest part of San Diego, Rancho Santa Fe. And, they, oh, and they, the, image, the image on the news, they all had these like Nike shoes, these like uh, nice, you know, like, nice, nice tennis shoes on. But they all, they all drank poison together, died. Um, that would be one implication. In any case, um, it, the, the, the life, it, would, it, it definitely detracts from the value of, of the life that we have here, here and now, no question, no question about it. And the other thing that it does, and I want you to notice this right away, and this is maybe even a more, if there's a, possibly a more serious objection, the Christian salvation flows from not myself, right, but from another, the Savior. It's what Christ has done, his obedience, his suffering for my sake, his dying on the cross, his rising again. Paul says we are in Christ when we believe in him. And everything depends. If Christ didn't live in the Christian view, we could not be saved. Now think of it this way. If your salvation is based upon the spark of God within you, why would you need Jesus? So this is an anti-gospel. Because this gospel would say, no, no, you've already got the basis of salvation within yourself. I compare it to, in the, my book to like a helium balloon in your chest, right? And imagine the moment after you die, the helium balloon gets released, and where does it go? It rises back to its source with God. So if that's you, you're, you're saved according to your very nature. You don't have to repent. You don't have to believe. And this is what many of the Gnostics taught, that salvation happens according to our nature. It directly conflicts with the idea of relying upon a savior who has made atonement for us and, and who has brought our salvation. I think you've been waiting Longest there, yeah, and further and further than back. Well, Origen, who proposed this view, he was the first to propose it, not the last, as I've said. He thought that he wasn't totally negative in answer to the gentleman's question here, that the present life was a, a life of training. We need, we need to diminish the influence of the body. And he was rather ascetic, meaning he, he refused to sleep on a, a bed with cushions on it. He slept on the floor. This is Origen himself. He fasted constantly. He thought that by punishing his body, he was purifying his soul. 
And that's sort of, that's a view, I mean, the word dualism is more than one meaning, but this is a dualistic view. The body is evil, the soul is good, and you need to diminish your body to purify your soul. Uh, that, the problem with that is when Jesus talked about serious sins, he said to the Pharisees that the prostitutes and the tax gatherers will get into heaven before you. Jesus seemed to think that those who sinned with their body, you know, fornicating, getting drunk, he didn't recommend it, but he thought that spiritual pride, which doesn't involve the body at all, was even more serious as a sin. So scripture doesn't support the idea that the spirit is necessarily good. Um, so, so there were Gnostics who were ascetic, <clears throat> and there were others who indulged their flesh. The, the logic of the latter, this was a minority group, but is if your body is not you, if my body were just like, I don't know, a piece of furniture like this table here, not who I am, then anything that happens to this table doesn't even affect me. You see where I'm going with this? Aha, so that I can do anything I want with my body. And so I can indulge the body in thinking particularly, you know, by eating, sexuality, whatever I want to do, it doesn't really even affect me. And so that's the, uh, that's the other logic. So either way, it's bad. In scripture, the body is, it's, it's like a humble beast of burden. It was given to do a function and we affirm it, but we don't either glorify it and we, and, and, nor do we punish it as such. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, and I've discovered this through teaching undergraduate uh, religion courses, theology courses with, with Christian students. Not all of them really understand the message of the resurrection. The message of the resurrection is that that we did not attain our final state until our bodies rise again. And it's, it's beyond rational comprehension. I mean, as someone who died by falling into a volcano, that person would, you know, the, 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 the material of their body would just become a puff of smoke, right? How does God bring that back? The God who created the universe can bring back the body that was, that, or someone buried at sea, you know? would be completely. So the resurrection is fundamental. Jesus makes a point of this saying, look, I am not a ghost, right? And he shows them his hands and sidewise so that they would see that on his physical body, he still bore and would bear for all eternity the marks of his suffering. How much more strong an affirmation of materiality could you get than that? Through all eternity, as the saints worship Christ in heaven, they will see the marks of his suffering on his body. They will know, those are the marks of time on eternity. Now, I found with some of my Christian students, some of them think that, like, yeah, we're pure spirits. They think, I don't know, when after Jesus died and was buried, that he, I don't know, he sort of dematerialized or something. Or maybe when he was ascending, he sort of vaporized. That, that is not at all the Christian teaching. Christian teaching is that he is a glorified human being, a God-man who continues to be human for all eternity. And some of the hymns are not that helpful, like the one, I'll fly away in the glory, hallelujah. It seems, it seems more of a Gnostic hymn to me than it does a Christian one, because it seems like, I guess my spirit just flies away and my body just is, is there in the grave. Okay. Uh, yes, that there's a, this is a common current. I mean, it's not everywhere. I don't think you find it. I think the traditional African religions were rather different, because they tended to be more this worldly. And, you know, the blessings of children, the fertile soil, so on. But Manichaeism could be regarded as actually a branch of Gnosticism. And then in Hinduism, you have sometimes radical asceticism. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the famous image of the man lying on the bed of nails. There were various forms of self-punishment or even self-torture that existed. And that said, you know, I, was, when I, was, I teach a course on religions of Asia. And I'll tell you one story. This is from Tibet. In Tibet, um, it is believed that in order to secure God's favor, you have to do this prayer. And the prayer only takes you like 30 seconds or a minute to do. But then you have to prostrate. You say the prayer, and then you prostrate yourself. And to get the full benefit of the prayer, you have to do it 100,000 times. They call it the great prostration. And there are people that would lose all the skin on their hands by rubbing them across. You imagine doing 100,000 times in succession. And people would they would become crippled because they would be doing this again and again. Some would use blocks of wood going across. When Jesus says in Matthew, he says, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose they'll be heard for their many words. This is exactly what he's talking about. So this idea of self-punishment, if only I punish myself. And of course, in, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, we have the horrific record of child sacrifice. People thought, if things are really going bad in my life, 
I will take that which is most valuable to be my own child. They would beat drums to drown out the sound of the, of the crying child and throw it into the charcoal fire to burn alive. So these are the horrible things that, of course, the natural mind is coming to on its own to try to say, I, somehow I have to win favor with God. And this is where the Christian message is such inc incredibly good news of how God himself has taken upon the burden of our sin and the person of Christ. In oh, in each, in each successive incarnation? Yeah. Typically it's seen as a stepwise progression that like, um, and, it, and they would say, oh, this, this Christian idea is so narrow, you know, so narrow that you have just this one life and like, well, aren't we created for eternity? This 19th century spiritualists were already saying this, the people that were communicating with purportedly deceased human spirits, whether they were deceased human spirits or something else, like demons, is an open question in Christian interpretation. But they, the idea is that, well, you know, we are created for eternity and this life is short, so, and, it's, and they would use examples of people who die young and say, well, certainly God gives them further opportunities. So you, you continue to make progress through multiple lives and that also naturally leads into a kind of universalism because people say, well, ultimately everybody learns their lesson, right? They learn their lesson and they escape from the cycle of rebirth. It's like taking one of those old metal coffee cans, you know? You put a bunch of pennies and you put a slot in the bottom. You shake it around, right? What happens? The pennies start falling out, you know, one by one. You say, well, life shakes you around. Everyone ultimately learns their lesson and so all the pennies ultimately fall out. And that was the ancient version of universalism that some of the Gnostics taught. Yeah. The um, question about the origin of the soul. Yeah, I, think, I think what is ruled out, there's a kind of a middle ground. There are two extreme positions. One would be a, a materialist view. There's nothing other than the body. And there are, there are people that hold that. When I was teaching at University of California, the Churchland, Paul and Patricia Churchland, they believed in mind-brain identity, that they're one and the same. And that when we talk about a person having a thought, that just means that neurons fired in the brain is nothing other than the material functioning of the neurons and so on. Now, there are many philosophers that have a problem with that because they say consciousness is something other than, it's like consciousness is always one step back. You try to look directly at it and sort of, it moves away from you. It's like something that's, that's hard to talk about. But the idea of a, that consciousness and mind is something other than matter in and of itself. I think on some level, Christian, Christ, the Christian faith is committed to that view. Um, but on the other extreme would be the dualist idea that body and spirit are completely separate from one another. And that's not really taught in scripture. Body and spirit are brought together. God created humanity from dust to the ground, it says breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. So you have body and spirit, that's the creation of Adam in that account in Genesis chapter two, and they actually belong together. If you take the strict separation view, which was defended by the philosopher Descartes, then you couldn't explain how the, the mind could affect the body. You know, whatever we think in your mind wouldn't affect your body, it'd be like a ghost going through a wall or something like, you know, it's like, oh, my mind will give an order to my arm. Let's see what happens. Whoa, it, have you ever tried this? Let's see. <laughs> oh, it happened again, let's try it again. Whoa. Every time my mind gives an order for my arm to rise, it rises again, you know? It's like, isn't that amazing? That this, philosophers call it the mind-body problem, right? So somehow, in profound ways, you know, we are actually mysterious. You think God is mysterious? We are a mystery to ourselves. In Psalm 139 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The Lord has made us, and there's a mystery even in ourselves our so-called subconsciousness, whether you want to call it that, or I'm not trying to be Freudian on you, but there are mysteries in human motivation, behavior, uh, that ultimately bring us back to the question of humanity, not just as body, but as soul as well. That's a big question. I, I, have, a, I have a whole presentation. My own students did a presentation. I gave them that topic of origin of consciousness. That was the whole thing. So I can send that to Jeremy. My question is really, how do you- Yeah, I'd be happy to forward that on, for sure. It's, it was a, they, they, they went into research. To, to my mind, this is one of these origins. I hope to write a book on origins and that would look at origins on multiple level. Origin of the cosmos. What do we find when we go back to t equals zero? We can't really explain it. I wanna to turn to, let's turn to the handout. Um, Cause we just have a few minutes left on that. If I could get one of those 
from these gentlemen. Um, what's wrong with Christian universalism? So we've been kind of talking around this, and I didn't get through all the, the different um, figures in the history of universalism. I'll just walk you through a few of them. We mentioned Origen. Augustine was a, crit a critic of Origen in the ancient church. This guy in the middle was Jakob Burma, was the mystical cobbler who kind of reinitiated universalism as, as it, after it was rejected in the early church. And we have a whole legacy in Germany, in England, in France before the revolution, Freemasons, many of them were universalists in Russia. And there are three very well-known 20th century theologians. I'm not old enough to know either of the guys on the left. The guy on the right, Jurgen Moltmann, probably the most famous theologian in Europe today, living theologian, I got to introduce at a conference. I didn't know it at the time. He is an ardent universalist who asserts that without any question, everyone will be saved. Evangelical universalism. The charismatic universalism, I mentioned John Crowder. He has these conferences that are devoted to what he calls spiritual drunkenness, where everyone dances around and it's like the part of the message, I mean, he's become a universalist. Everyone is saved. All of our sins are covered. His followers on YouTube have open Bibles and they do imaginary lines of cocaine off of their Bibles and they stagger around. He stands up with a cross and he pretends like it's a marijuana pipe and then he staggers and laughs. And, um, you can recommend this, by the way. I'm not recommending it. The book Epistle to Jude talks about turning the grace of God into licentiousness. So this is really, a, this is the guy that I mentioned didn't like my message in my book because I critiqued him. But I think what, the, one of the things the universes have forgotten, the nature of evil itself. And, um, okay, so, um, so what's wrong with Christian universalism? Well, I've tried to just sum up some, some points here. We need to use scripture rightly. And this would be a general point. I think you could apply to a lot of the talks and messages that you're getting here at, at Faith Ascent. We need to avoid a, a one verse theology or even a five or six passage theology. The scripture, Old and New Testaments have 1,189 chapters. And so that's a lot to, to look at and to compare to try to look at the whole council everything that scripture has to say. If you take one verse out of context, how about uh, John 14, 28? Jesus says, and this is a direct quote, the Father is greater than I. Ah, oh, well that means Jesus is not God, right? He's saying, oh, I'm not God, the Father's God, but I'm not. No, the answer is no. Read the first verse in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, you know that one? And the Word was with God, and it's emphatically clear, the Word was God. John 1.1, 1, 1, put alongside of John 14.28, helps us to understand. So this would be very careful when you're talking to someone who's a universalist, or really holding to any view that deviates from the, the historical teaching of the church. They may be twisting, taking texts out of context. We need to also avoid speculation. I mentioned like that death theology, everyone at the moment of death gets their final option to say, give thumbs up or thumbs down to God. Well, that's an interesting theory. What basis is there for believing it? Why should I believe that? And this is one of those theories that universalists have latched onto that doesn't really have any basis in scripture. Um, I also use the, the analogy of the opiate addict, a sort of false hope. Also, you know, I've been studying the book of Jeremiah recently, and Jeremiah encountered people in his day that said, Everything is fine, you know. God loves us. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, it's, if you practice idolatry, oh, God will forgive that. Just, you know, be sick. You know, pray the sinner's prayer every time you sacrifice a ball. Go ahead and pray, and it will be okay. And these were the false prophets of his day. And Jeremiah said, they, they have healed the wound of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And these people were still preaching this, this easygoing message that sin was not really a serious thing, even as the Babylonian army is coming up to the city of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is about to fall. In fact, they, they beat up Jeremiah, they put him in the stocks, they threw him in a cistern at one point. Why? Because he was saying, 
people, you need to repent. And I look at the age that we're living in, the moral decline we're in, we have false prophets among us. We have people that are giving, and what is the mark of a false prophet? A false prophet gives false hope. You don't have to repent, everything will be okay. And if you judge it in that way, it makes sense that we have universalism appearing at this particular time in history. Because people would rather live in a fantasy of not being accountable to God than to, to, than to think the opposite, that we actually do and will experience God's judgment. So I, I end here with I have four inescapable truths. And this was in response to uh, some that I encountered in uh, Alabama that had an, are, were trying to make an argument from Scripture for universal salvation. The first point that I think is clear in Scripture, salvation is through Jesus Christ. I think you know the verse, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so that point would be denied by interreligious universalists, those who would say all paths lead to God. But let's add to that three other points. Salvation requires a human response to God through faith or repentance or obedience. That's pretty clear in scripture, isn't it? Jesus spoke of faith. The apostles preached, said repent and believe. And so that idea of a response being necessary. Now, does anyone deny that? Yeah, there are people like Karl Barth. I haven't really talked about him, but he, he believes that God has made an eternal decision for us. He decided for us, so it almost eliminates your own choice altogether. So like he's decided, so I guess Richard Dawkins is gonna be in heaven, right? No, 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 and, and uh, the Archangel Gabriel is pulling Richard Dawkins in, you know? No, no, he's screaming, but he's going to be there anyway. Okay, two, two more points. Some people, quite simply, some people come to the end of their life without having made that decision, right? That's pretty clear, right? There are some who refuse to the very end of their life. Maybe it's been presented to them. There are cases we're not quite sure about, but sometimes it's crystal clear. This person has heard about Jesus. I don't want to have anything to do with him. Then there was Heinrich Heine. When he died, he said, God will forgive me. That's his job. Not the best attitude. Presuming on God. But many significant numbers don't make that decision. And then what's the last point? Scripture never tells us that there will be a further opportunity. We could speculate on that, we could debate it, but again, false hope is the danger here. To trust in some opportunity, the Scripture doesn't say that we will have. There's nothing in Scripture that says that there's anything beyond the present life. And so where do we go with that? And you could read, if you're interested to read my Christianity Today interview, I think the evangelical world and the Christian world generally need to recover a sense of urgency. All the choices that we make day by day have eternal consequences for ourselves, but also for those around you. You could be the instrument through whom God intends to bring someone else to Christ. And obviously if you refuse to collaborate, participate in that, God can achieve his end in some other way. Do an end run around you, maybe work through another person. But isn't it a privilege that we not only have the opportunity to be in relationship with our Heavenly Father, but we have the, have the opportunity to be instruments of grace? And the greatest thing of all is to be an, inter -grace, inter an instrument of grace willingly and voluntarily and knowledgeably, like to know that you're participating in the, in the plan and the, and the purposes of God. And beyond that, we don't have to answer every question about the fate of everyone who's ever lived, but we are called, Jesus, you know, we're called to love our neighbor, and the ultimate love is to seek for them to be in relationship to him. So I hope that as you come to the end of this uh, base camp experience, that you are energized, and that you don't just, you know, you're not just tight lips, zip-locking your lips while you're around people who don't already know the Lord. I know that not everyone here professes to be a Christian. But I'm really speaking right now to those who do profess to know him. This is, this is really the hour, the time, the age when we need to be more bold in taking a stand for the Lord and speaking up strongly on, on his behalf as the Lord gives us opportunity. Well, uh, there is an ultimate faith decision here to believe that God is both loving and just. And because he is just, it means that he will deal with different cases differently. In fact, 
the people who are most accountable before God is the ones who know the most. And uh, it says in, 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 um, in the Gospel of Luke, to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. And, you know, Dante, who was the great medieval poet, represented the afterlife, and he saw that there were different degrees of heaven, also different degrees of punishment, that those who sin willfully and knowledgeably against the message of Christ were punished much more severely. And he thought that there were some who were barely punished at all. That, again, we're get kind of in a realm of speculation, um, <coughs> but it's possible that, I just think that, you know, C.S. Lewis made an interesting statement once he said, heaven will not be the place where we go where all our questions are answered. He said, but heaven instead is the place where once we are there, we will see that the question never really existed at all. Mm. That, now that, that's a statement of faith. It's like we, we're actually entrusting ourselves, putting ourselves in God's hands. God, I really don't understand this. Here is a friend of mine who was an atheist, was a Hindu, was a Buddhist, lived a very good life, maybe a better life than I'm living, and yet died suddenly in a car accident. I think we have to put ourselves, I really think we have to put ourselves in God's hands to that, say, I'm gonna stand on what has been revealed in the word, and I can't answer that question, ultimately, it's how God's justice will be affected in every case. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sure. McClendon.